साइज ऑफ दैट कोल्यूशन अरिथमेटिकली बिकेम मोर देन आर द बिहार लॉस विल नॉट चोल्ड रिफॉर्म से फाइनेंस मिनिस्टर अरुण जेटली प्रोमिस टू सिट अक्रॉस द टेबल एंड टॉक टू एनी कांग्रेस लीडर टू पुश द गुड एंड सर्विस टैक्स टू द राज्य सभा द क्रूशल विंटर सेशन ऑफ पार्लियामेंट विल बिगेन ऑन द ट्वेंटी सिक्स ऑफ नवंबर Markets recover from the Bihar jolt after a massive gap down open. Nifty recouped up 150 points to end with marginal losses. Mid caps end with healthy gains. Trading slowly but surely the economy is on an uptick. The Nifty will not fall below 7500 says the big bull Rakesh Junjunwala terms Bihar as a short term negative but expects consolidation for 3 to 6 months. After five months, Maggie Noodles back with the bang. Pre-orders on Snap deals sold out in minutes. Nestle's India head says winning back customers' trust will be the top priority. BCCI undertakes sweeping reforms. Entry Nivas is booted out as the ICC chairman. As Shashank Manohar takes charge, Justice A P Shah has been appointed the ombudsman, and Roger Binney is removed as the chief selector. As his son Stuart Binney is part of the team. The government's coffers are ringing. Indirect tax collections grew nearly 37% in October, but stripped off additional duties. The growth is just over 11%. Tata's and Boeing come together to make in India agree to form a joint venture to manufacture aerostructure for aircraft and hardware for the military. Sun Pharma coughs in trade. Thanks to harsh observations from the U.S. drug regulator on its Halol facility, Dr. Reddy also slumps after three of its plants receive warning letters. A historic day in Myanmar as the country hopes to usher in democracy after 25 years. Aung San Suu Kyi's party makes a solid start. The country is currently counting underway. The son of Lord Swaraj Paul and the head of Capital Steel Angad Paul dies in London after falling from his penthouse apartment. He was 45 years old. Surely, the defeat in Bihar. you know may push back whatever legislative permissions are needed but mr modi is going to do exactly what he wanted what he was planning to do the bihar election results are not going to change him accordingly obviously the arithmetic of the grand alliance was much bigger than ours if these parties contesting separately during the lok sabha election you total up their votes It's almost close to what they got now. मैं देखता हूँ ज्योति बाबू के बाद मेरी नजरों में सबसे सम्मानीय कौन वहाँ पर आदरणीय है? हाँ, सबसे ज़्यादा बढ़िया व्यक्ति या व्यक्तित्व नीतीश कुमार। Nitish is back. Lalu has risen from the ashes, and the man who was dubbed as BJP's Chanakya Amit Shah is facing criticism. The message from Patna has sent shock waves across India, and Dalal Street was no exception. Good evening, and thanks for joining us here on India Business Hour. And Nanta Rai, we're going to begin the show by talking about the markets. The bulls managed to recover from a sharp gap down opening. The Nifty ended with losses of about 40 points, and that's after recovering nearly 150 points from the lows. A ditto story for the Sensex as banking stocks helped the markets pull back in late trade. Mid caps outperformed today. That index ending with some healthy gains. The government today came out to soothe Fred Nerf, saying that reforms would not be hampered by the results in Bihar, and that message did help the bulls on the last street. The centre has announced the dates for the winter session. In the meanwhile, the parliament is going to convene on the 26th of November and end. On the 23rd of December, the BJP Parliamentary Board met in the capital earlier today to take stock of the shocking defeat in Bihar. Top leaders were all in attendance at this meeting that was chaired by the Prime Minister. Speaking post that, Finance Minister Arun Jaitley told the press the NDA got the arithmetic wrong in Bihar. 
He refused to blame controversial statements by the few BJP leaders for the defeat, saying there are always aberrations, and pleaded to all BJP leaders to continue the narrative of reforms and development. As far as the RSS, he said the BJP, since its inception, has supported reservation when it came to the backward people and based on socio-economic conditions. The big question now is, what's going to happen to reforms? Sapna Das, caught up with the finance minister earlier in the day, Arun Jaitley promised the reforms juggernaut would not be hampered. Jaitley said he's ready to sit across the table and talk to any Congress leader to help pass the GST in the Rajya Sabha. Not just that, he asked Nitish Kumar to help pass the GST as it would help consuming states like Bihar. One of the assumptions which we made, and many others in the media, including the pollsters were making, was uh, there is an electoral chemistry which is different from arithmetic. The developmental agenda will take over, and hence, for them to transfer vote of conflicting parties to each other may not be easy. Mm. That did not happen. I think... Uh, the index of their unity in terms of transferability of the vote was very high. Contention from the other side was the fact that you put the rates in the, in the Constitution Amendment Bill which is not feasible at all. And the second was on the manufacturing tax. Is there any further space now available for further negotiation on any of these two aspects? I think the first one stands ruled out. What about the manufacturing tax? Because so that again, sir, you take a decision can, of talking to can, states. We can always discuss those issues if they have a suggestion. Because I am for a GST with a proper architecture, not for a GST with a defective architecture. So if there is any suggestion in the direction of strengthening GST and its architecture, I am certainly open to that. So we have Diwali time and we have the test coming in now at this point in time. In fact, the expectation was this that since uh, you know, half the fiscal is already over, probably there was no requirement for no, this half see, I, 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 I'll tell you, test. it's required because uh, 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 there is a pressure on public finances. Don't forget one fact that today we are reaching a high growth figure or a reasonably high growth figure essentially on the strength of public investment and FDI. I had in the budget said, which was approved by parliament, that the Swachh Bharat says can be up to 2%. We've only imposed 0.5%. We have no intention of increasing it. But, uh, you know, you also increase excise and petrol by rupee and 60% per liter and, uh, you know, marginally on diesel. Uh, what do you plan to do with these funds and what was the requirement to do it? This is the fifth hike and... Uh, See, I'll tell you. There this is this a, may be price neutral, sir, if I may just complete my question. No, no, but this the is, point is... A, this is, price, this is price neutral. It doesn't go on to... Yeah, but you will not get the benefit of lower prices. You see, the benefit of lower oil prices is being split three ways. First, a large chunk of it goes to the consumers. So, several times the prices have gone down. Two, a lot of it is going into infrastructure. So, how are the rural roads being built? How are the highways being built? These are also being built for the people who drive their vehicles on those cars. So, those who use the diesel and petrol are the ones who drive their vehicles on those uh, roads. And therefore, you need the roads. So, part of it is going for the roads. A part of it is, a large part of it has already gone to the consumers and a very small part of it has gone because oil companies in future purchases are lost. They buy at $80 and sell at $60. So it's covered up their losses. So that's a legitimate expenditure. So it's really been divided three ways. It's not that the government has uh, pocketed the money for some extraneous purpose. It's been done for those who drive vehicles. Does the finance minister, uh, you know, alling any fears that investors may have after that verdict that came out of Bihar? You just heard what he said, the government can't afford to cut down on expenditure. So where is all of this money going to come for, given the fact that this investment pipeline is looking like it's under threat? It's perhaps going to come from indirect tax collections. On a day when the finance minister admitted the exchequer's finances are under strain, indirect tax collections have risen by nearly 37% in October. Not just that, for this fiscal so far, tax collections are higher by about 36% when compared to last year. Here's the kicker though. This remarkable rise is thanks to additional duties that have been levied by the centre. We're talking about, for example, the oil cess. 
also the withdrawal of exemptions for example for the auto sector without this taxes have grown by just over 11% when compared to last year we did have bmr earlier on the show uh, earlier in the day on cnbc tv18 when a partner at bmr advisor said that thanks to this cushion we've also seen the tax department actually expedite the process of a, a refunding service tax all of that also likely to put the fisc under threat so that's the story as far as the macro economy goes i'm now going to welcome shireen she's joining us from london she's there in preparation for the prime minister's three day visit uh, to the financial capital of europe over to you shireen Well, thanks very much, Nanta. And sorry for joining you late on India Business Hour, but we were just wrapping up an interview here, talking to fund managers on the strength of the India story. And at this point in time, people continue to believe in the long-term India story, but of course, in the short term, uh, they do feel that uh, uh, the pace of reforms and, of course, the, the equity market story is perhaps going to be a little bit more constrained. We'll get you all of that in just a bit, but let's talk about the big market voice for the day. Rakesh Junjunwala, never a man to mince his words, continues to buy the Indian equity story in the long term but in the short term he too does believe that Indian markets will continue to see some consolidation but he believes that the Nifty is unlikely to fall below 7,500. Here's a big bull on India and then we'll return with more market voices. I think there's more clarity. You know markets have corrected, time has passed, expectations have moderated and the flow of local money is, you know, progressing very well. And I think slowly but surely the economy is on an uptick. So the expectations bellied, you know, and uh, commitments reduced, domestic money coming, economy on upswing. I think we are at a bottom. That, that, that's a big statement. Uh, you think we have a bottom somewhere in this zone of 76 to 7,800 Nifty? It would surprise you if the market yeah. broke those levels and went lower? I think the big uncertainty only is this banking problem. So I think this matter of these bad debts in, in the public sector banks and some private sector banks is going to come to a head in the next six to nine months. I don't see any other area where the markets will call catch up, catch up by surprise. Because, see, you suppose you had That's expectation, a... make in India, defense, bail, I mean, to name a company, now you know those stocks have corrected, and I think with time to come, those expectations will actually turn out to be real. You know, the market got too excited initially. It was not without reason. So I feel, you know, the initial euphoria that or honeymoon that the market had, is over, reality has set in. At the same time, I think the government is working slowly but surely, and we are going to see results for all the efforts they are making. I was speaking to Vallabh Bansali just a few days back, and he constantly uh, spoke about that problem as being a, a real Achilles heel. And you started off this discussion by alluding to that as well. The, do you think things can actually get much worse there over the next six, nine months before they get better? All countries have had a sector. Have had, have had problems in the banking sector. The question is, it was being hidden. I think in the next three to six to nine months, it will come out in the open. And once it comes in, a climax solution will be found. Suppose a loan is there. It's not that assets are not there. Only the banks are trying to prolong the inevitable. But do you think it's a problem, as a lot of people think, it's a public sector banking problem? Or does the Axis Bank experience tell you that there could be some skeletons coming out of even the private banking closet? I think except Kotak and HDFC is a problem with every bank, but in varying degrees. Well, that was the big bull, and you can catch more of that interview through the day on CNBC TV 18 tomorrow. But we're not done with influential market voices just yet. The countdown to Diwali and the new Sambat has begun. Latha caught up with a bunch of market experts to find out how they're reading the equity market movement ahead of Sambat. And, of course, I also spoke with Rob Marshall Lee of Newton Asset Management, bullish on India, in fact, very bullish on India. So listen in to more influential market opinion. It's been a year in two halves. Uh, from last summer till March, the market kept rallying. Uh, and I think we all did reasonably well. And I think it was post the disappointment of the budget and then the EM crisis, which then sparked the sell-off. 
And even post that, I think the market's been acting wonderfully in terms of the rotation between sectors and specific stocks. So no reason really to complain. It's a great time to be an investor seeking alpha in India. Uh, and Madhu promises he's going to give us five great multi-bagger ideas. <laughs> so, no, I, in that hope we stay alive. Manish, you don't have to concur. But do no, you think, think that 9,100 remains see, uh, a roof? The problem is you might lose 10%. And you will almost certainly make at least 50% in three years. Is that a good bet or not? No, that's so a instead bet. of obsessing about, oh, the market can go down, of course it can and it will. For sure it will go down 10% repeatedly four or five times. If you look at history of all these great companies from Microsoft to Infosys to everything, they all had precipitous declines of 20-20% across their career. The question is, are you invested enough and are you holding it for long term enough so that you don't get scared out of the market when it does go to 7,000, if it does. So one new thing which I learned Lata in the last two, three years myself when I've been really digging deep, that you know, when you talk about this, what you're worried about is not the risk, you're worried about volatility. So let us differentiate what is the difference between risk and volatility. So market can market be volatile, they can be volatile and they will be volatile, that's the nature of market for 100 years. But Ken, are they risky? If you have time by your side and if you have the right portfolio manager by your side, are they risky? No. While fixed deposit is actually risky, you know, mm -hmm. much to the misconception of people, yes, because you are losing out the opportunity cost. Okay. Who has paid? Who has You're paid? Losing for, capital. No, no, you who know? But ultimately, it, whether you are whether you are losing money or whether you are losing profits, it's a loss. If, if let's say fixed deposit has gone up 10 times in the last, uh, last 20 years and uh, mutual fund has gone up 80 times, that 70 times someone has paid. Yes. It is just that because you don't lose money, you are unconscious about that loss. You are unconscious about the loss of profit. So let me just, you know, sum it up because Diwali is a fantastic time. It actually pains someone like me who has been in the mutual fund business for now 15 years that retail investors are still not participating in the India story to the extent they should be participating because you are stuck in the wrong question. You are stuck, kab lena hai, kya lena hai. Please change it. Kitna lena aur kitne time ke le lena hai. And I think you will get it right. And actually speaking, if you explained well, uh, uh, explained well, which is what you are giving us the time today. So I think they will ask this question. It is not that savings are meant for one year. Savings are actually meant for 5-10 years. Yes. So if they start putting some amount of this saving for 5-10 years, I think after 5 years they, they need not be uh, taught any of this. You know, They will see the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So Ramdev, on those lines, is 9100 going to be the high for some time now? So my sense is a lot of surprises are in store, positive, allergy and negative. Okay, so uh, we could be we could be anywhere but as I said, now today expectation is low. So we are I think we'll have a very decent time in on a 12 months basis, and uh, if you have an investing horizon of three to five years, I think I think there'll be a year when markets will rise by 50, 60, 70 percent. So take your position, because we don't know whether it is going to be starting from tomorrow or after it's, after it's starting of a year. We always invest with a long-term time horizon, um, and one of the things we like about India and have done for many years is is the, the long-term thematic exposure. So. Uh, very good population dynamics, uh, a lot of potential in terms of catch-up productivity, uh, a lot of low-hanging fruit in the economy. And the, the really good thing is India is also just coming out of the bottom of a credit cycle. The investment thesis for us is quite straightforward. Uh, there's a lot of pent-up demand, uh, there's a lot of gummed-up infrastructure. Um, the, the previous government had done a, a pretty poor job and the bureaucracy had ground things to halt, particularly in the power sector. Uh, and now the, the new government, I mean really we thought any change in government was likely to improve that, but clearly the Modi government is moving things on. Uh, sometimes people get a bit too optimistic about it happening too quickly, um, but we're quite happy about the way things are, are progressing. An area of influential market voices there with their thoughts on where the Lyle Street is headed in the short term. Now, while Shireen in London might be excited about munching on fish and chips, I tell you what back home the excitement's about. Maggie noodles, they're back after five months after the ban was imposed by the food regulator in the country. Nestle India, armed with all the laboratory clearances, has relaunched the popular instant noodles across the country at select stores. 
but that's apart from the eight states which still haven't revoked the ban imposed by the local administration and if the demand on snap deal which has also been roped in to sell the instant noodles online is anything to go by it looks like the nation was waiting with bated breath for Maggie noodles. Snap Deal, which is selling a pack of 12 noodles for 144 rupees, ran out of stock within hours of beginning that flash sale. CNBC TV 18 learns Nestle is now planning to increase the supply to the e-commerce website to meet that huge demand. Over the weekend, Ranjoy Banerjee caught up with Nestle India's managing director Suresh Narayanan as Indian retail shelves get ready to welcome back Maggie. I'm delighted to say that uh, uh, that uh, the situation now is, is much better than, right. uh, than, than what it was and uh, with great delight uh, I will be having the privilege on, uh, on behalf of uh, the Nestle organization to uh, give back uh, to the consumer right. what uh, belongs to them, right. uh, Brand Maggie. Right. Uh, currently uh, about three government laboratories have cleared it in uh, places like uh, Goa, Karnataka, Punjab and I also remember that you asking f uh, for approvals from the governments of Uttarakhand and Himachal Pradesh for producing Maggi. Can you sure. give us an update now to begin with how many states will be producing it and have you got those approvals from Uttarakhand and Himachal? Sure. Uh, look, in terms of the, of the final testing, uh, as had been mandated by the Honorable uh, High Court, uh, there was a two-stage testing process that was undertaken. Uh, one was that uh, right after the verdict, uh, there was a, there was a, a testing process uh, where samples were, were drawn and sent to three accredited uh, laboratories for uh, testing of, of, of lead. Uh, they came 100% clean. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we had, we were allowed to start uh, uh, manufacturing trials. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did the manufacturing trials and the manufacturing trials samples were also sent mm -hmm. uh, to, um, to the laboratories in Mohali, in right. uh, Jaipur and in, uh, in Hyderabad. And uh, a couple of days back, uh, uh, those analyses also have shown that we are 100% uh, clean. So how many laboratories now have, have found that? Well, these are three accredited laboratories. Right. Uh, for, and this is what was mandated at the, by the, at the court, court as far as the, the initial testing was concerned mm -hmm. uh, and also on the manufacturing uh, trial testing was concerned. So mm -hmm. it is basically okay. across three accredited uh, laboratories. Right. And this really uh, also cements uh, uh, over 3,500 tests that the company itself has done across uh, our own uh, Nestle quality assurance laboratories and external laboratories uh, to uh, to uh, vindicate mm -hmm. the stand that Nestle has always had right. that we have been safe, right. we are safe, and we will continue to be safe. Right, right. But uh, and in, in terms of getting approvals from the governments of Himachal and Uttarakhand, well, uh, at the moment we have uh, we have started out of the five locations for manufacture. We have started. Uh, manufacturing in uh, in Moga in Punjab in uh, in Bichulim in Goa and also Nanjangod in Karnataka and uh, as I speak to you uh, we are in uh, in dialogue with the uh, governments of Himachal and right. the, and the government of Uttarakhand uh, in order to uh, uh, allow us to commence uh, manufacturing at our plants in Taliwal and in Patna. So give us a date then, Mr. Naran. When do we see the Maggi hitting uh, uh, coming back onto the shelves? Well, I can I can be I can be uh, fairly specific to you. 9th of November. 9th of November. Okay. We will be introducing Maggie back again mm -hmm. in the hands of the consumer. It will be it will be a selective uh, rollout. Right. Right. Uh, exactly. It, we, we are not in a position now to extend yes. it to to all parts of the country. But I'm delighted that uh, you know this has been a long, long journey, and uh, it will really be uh, I think a culmination of this journey. Uh, to give back the brand uh, to the millions of consumers uh, mm -hmm. who have stood by us uh, in all the times uh, of uh, trials and tribulations. Well, that's the Nestle India MD talking about the return of Maggie and 9th November is when the country gets to welcome back Maggie noodles. But let's talk about another big story here that we've been tracking very closely on CNBC TV 18. Tata Advanced Systems, part of the Tata Group, is the first company in India to ink a joint venture with Boeing. Remember, you heard the Boeing management speak to CNBC TV 18 just a few days ago saying that they were looking at the possibility of a joint venture and this is the first that's off the ground. Ritu Parnabuyan wraps up that big development for you. This is the AH-64 Apache, a proven attack helicopter manufactured by Boeing and used by the U.S. Army and the Defense Forces of the U.K., the Netherlands and Israel. 
This two-seater helicopter will now have an Indian connection, Tata Advanced Systems. That's because Boeing has entered into a joint venture agreement with Tata Advanced Systems to produce aerostructures for these helicopters. A first-of-its-kind deal for Boeing in India. Joint venture kind of makes sense from a return to shareholder point of view, right? Uh, so we evaluate on a case-by-case -case basis, does it make sense or not, right? Mm -hmm. uh, from, from our point of view, the compelling reason for doing manufacturing in India is productivity capture mm -hmm. that we could do with partnerships with, with Indian companies that we do pretty well. And, and discharge of offset obligation, which doesn't really require us to set up a joint venture. According to Boeing, the joint venture will not only supply aerostructures for the Apache helicopter, but will also compete with other suppliers for manufacturing components of defense and civilian platforms. India has recently ordered 22 Apache and 15 Chinook transport helicopters, and delivery of these platforms is likely to start in the next couple of years. The contracts are signed. So we are in the execution phase at this stage. The delivery starts in 2019. That's when the first aircraft of, uh, of each type will be delivered. This JV goes a long way in furthering Boeing's ongoing strategy of deepening its India engagement. After all, Boeing has already doubled its sourcing from Indian companies and the Tatas are not new to working with the American giant. Tata Advanced Systems already manufactures fuselage for Boeing's CH-47 Chinook helicopters and the AH-6I light attack helicopter. Boeing also has partnership agreements with other Tata Group companies. Tata Advanced Materials, for instance, delivers components for Boeing's P-8I maritime surveillance aircraft. The TAL Manufacturing Solutions makes critical components for the Boeing 7879 aircraft and also provides ground support equipment for the C-17 Globemaster. Analysts say this deal is not only a feather in the cap for Tata Advanced Systems, it's a score for Prime Minister Narendra Modi's Make in India campaign and could push other global aerospace giants like Airbus to forge similar joint ventures with other Indian companies. In New Delhi with the Tupan Abhiyan, Nantara Rai. And while we're speaking of Boeing, Indian Airlines are fast modernizing their fleet of aircraft. The country's oldest private airline, Jet Airways, has placed a fresh order for 75 Boeing 737 MAX aircraft with an option of purchasing 50 additional planes if required. This deal, which will be financed via sale and leaseback agreements, will see Jet getting its first aircraft from 2018. More news from the aviation sector. This is one landing that's been looked upon by everybody eagerly, including its competitors in the aviation industry. As the country's most profitable airline, Indigo, is all set to listen the last week tomorrow, a lot is riding on this IPO. While the subscription numbers do point towards a good listing, the tepid response seen amongst the new listings is definitely weighing in on sentiments. The stock may not be cheap, but the grey market is pointing towards a positive opening for the largest IPO in three years with a price band of 700 to 765 rupees per share. While we're talking about investor sentiment, let's head back to Shireen. Shireen, is London ready for Prime Minister Modi? <laughs> Well, it's gearing up, Nantara, for Prime Minister Modi's visit on the 12th. Remember, uh, as we reported here on CNBC TV 18 this morning, the Prime Minister comes in on the 12th, and uh, there will be a CEO forum that will take place. In fact, what we understand from sources, uh, people like Cyrus Misti, Aditya Puri, Baba Kalyani, uh, Tulsi Tanti, they will be part of the CEO forum. Uh, CEOs will be meeting both Prime Minister David Cameron as well as Prime Minister Modi on the 13th. And, of course, defense, skills, development, financial services, regulatory reform. These are going to be some of the issues that will be here for discussion. Of course, CNBC TV 18 in full force here, tracking the developments. But we've started off on a, on a rather unfortunate note because uh, it, was a, it was a coincidence. We were supposed to interview Lord Swaraj Paul, the steel magnate, uh, the man behind Kaparo uh, Industries here this morning. And unfortunately, his son, uh, Angad Paul, his youngest son, 45-year-old, uh, uh, died uh, on Sunday. Sunday, that's the 8th of November. Uh, the police at this point in time have ruled out any suspicious circumstances, but it is an unfortunate development. Remember, Kaparo Industries has been going through some fairly difficult times. Uh, in fact, out of the 20 businesses as part of the group, 16 have now been put into administration. PwC has been appointed as the administrator. Let me also bring in my colleague, Sanjay Suri. He's uh, here with us in London, also tracking the action. Sanjay, thanks very much for joining us on CNBC TV. Let me start by first asking you about the unfortunate incident with 
with Angad Paul and then we'll talk about Prime Minister Modi's visit. It's been difficult for the Kaparo group over the last uh, several months now. Well, it's been getting difficult for British steel industry itself in, in, in the UK and, and Kaparo inevitably has been caught up in it. Yeah. Particularly Angad Paul, I mean, he was involved with the group earlier. Then he branched out into filmmaking that was quite successful for a while, then not so successful, then was back in the steel business uh, with the family. But clearly the, the business has not been going very well mm. and he's been associated with that difficulties uh, quite uh, inevitably. Yeah, absolutely. And that is, of course, going to be something that we are going to have to track as, as to what happens now with the administrator. PwC has been appointed to look at what happens to these businesses, whether they'll be restructured, divested, and so on and so forth. But let's talk about Prime Minister Modi's visit here. Uh, you know, you had Xi Jinping here in London just a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, and of course, the comparisons are being made about the kind of reception that Prime Minister Modi is likely to enjoy. The Wembley occasion is going to be the big one, the Madison Square equivalent here in London. You just returned from Wembley. What's going on there uh, all set up well I've seen more empty seats than I've ever seen before <laughs> and I see but them filling not, up not on the 13th. I see them filling up on the 13th and I'm waiting to see what that will look like mm. 60,000 uh, you think 60,000 because uh, they can't take more you see because the stage is on one side of the stadium right. and of course they're not going to have people on the side and behind mm. and therefore 60,000 and not more and they say they have a waiting list um, uh, but uh, this really will be what this visit is about on the other matters that you mentioned, you know, uh, a, a lot of very senior executives from India, they will be here, they'll be meeting the prime ministers. But usually mm. the pattern has been that when India and Britain sit down to talk, mm. they agree only to talk some more. <laughs> so uh, whether this will lead to a lot of uh, rhetoric huh. and uh, statement of intentions huh. or to substantive business, mm. uh, we have to see in days ahead, but it is very likely to be uh, uh, more talk and and more around soft skills because mm. the British want to sell consultancy. Mm. They don't want to, they don't want to put pounds on the ground in India. Mm. They don't, don't don't want to come and soil their hands. Mm. So it is consultancy that they want to offer from here and through visiting. India. And my final question, Sanjay, and of course we're going to continue this conversation through this week here on CNBC TV 18 with you, uh, but on, on any controversial issues that are likely to be taken up, tax of course is going to be one of them, but this other business about, you know, the growing perception of intolerance in India and whether that's likely to come up, because I understand that the Foreign Secretary in London did seem to suggest so. Well, I was at this meeting where Mr. Philip Hammond, the Foreign Secretary, said that the Moody's report and that, of course, has some content indicating that uh, there is disquiet over the position of minorities and that will have a knock-on effect on investment, mm. that this is something that the British will raise, uh, which is to say the Prime Minister Cameron will raise mm. with Mr. Modi. Certainly, if he were to do so, that's going to create a good deal of tension. Mr. Yeah. Modi is not going to take kindly to this kind of intervention from Britain. He's very likely to tell them that we can look after our own. We don't mm. need advice from you. So if that issue were to come up, there is a, a, a very likely to be some political tension. Mm. And if we take that together uh, with uh, indications that we're not going to have very big ticket business announcements through the visit, yeah. uh, we could be running the risk of you creating political friction without a very big business fallout. Absolutely. So we'll have to see whether that indeed is taken up as part of the Prime Minister's visit. But, you know, we've been talking to investors here in London, talking to them about the India story and whether they are looking at allocating more capital to India, how they read the markets at this point in time. And yes, Jerome Booth, he of course has been a big bull on emerging markets. He's the author of Emerging Markets in an Upside-Down World. He continues to believe in the strength of EMs, specifically India. Listen in to what he has to say. Sort of permanent negative uh, psychology against emerging markets, when actually the bigger risks are still in the United States and Europe. And we have a particularly, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, unnerving sort of uh, period coming up. We have the possibility of uh, uh, obviously change in rates in the U.S. Yeah. Um, and if that fails, maybe more QE. Yeah. Um, and that could be quite disruptive, particularly after a very long period of this huge expectation of a change in interest rates. And the U.S. Fed is between a very difficult position on the one hand of, of wanting to be prepared for inflation when it comes because at the moment they're all completely behind the curve on the other hand not causing recession and it may well be there's no middle ground 
So if you look at emerging markets um, as a place to reduce risk, not just somewhere you invest in for extra risk and extra return, and you start looking at the macroeconomics and you start getting up beyond the hype, you realize actually they're relatively safe when it comes to the big macroeconomic risks. And uh, you know, on the point of, if we're going to talk about specifically India, very clearly India's benefiting uh, from lower oil prices. Uh, it's, it's got a huge potential um, uh, to, to be unleashed, but it's already growing much, much stronger than any developed wor uh, world country. So I think there's a lot of uh, good news which just isn't being priced in. You know, speaking of India, and I'll, I'll talk to you about the Fed in just a moment, but we've had uh, electoral results coming in from the yeah. Bihar elections, which have gone against the government. And there is caution now on the strength of the reform process and whether this government will be able to push through the kind of reforms that it would have liked to. How are foreign investors going to read what's happening on the political scene in India? Not good. Um, clearly, the VAT is a big disappointment. There has been. You mean the GST? Uh, yeah, the G sorry, the GST. And, uh, and the... Um, the inability to push even that after a, a, such a huge sort of effort um, is, is, a, is a major blow and you know one hopes that uh, uh, there can be sort of reinvigorated uh, uh, energy um, but the idea that uh, it was good enough to have a, a lower house majority you know we might have to revisit that on the other hand um, expectations about uh, you know everything happening tomorrow, which is obviously common in in, in for investors and, and more. Well, that's Jerome Booth there looking at India. Of course, very positive on the India Telecom story, investing in the Indian Telecom story, and uh, already picked up controlling stake in two companies in India. But we'll get you more on that here on CNBC TV 18, along with other big influential voices talking about India and Prime Minister Narendra Modi's visit here. I am unfortunately going to wrap up here from London because we're off to our next interview. So then, Tara, I hand it back to you for the rest of India Business Hour. Thanks, Shireen. Enjoy London. And just to let you know, a guitar once belonging to John Lennon has just sold for $2.41 billion. Shireen is going to be back in India Business Hour tomorrow. We are going to slip into a short break. On the other side is Dantara is back home, but the yellow metal isn't shining very well today. We'll tell you why after the short break. Stay tuned.